Okay, this is the last lecture for Sam Scheffler's Death and the Afterlife on Chapter 3. This chapter is about the fear of death and whether immortality is even a coherent aim for a human life. There's an assumption that we walk around with that is, seems both reasonable and natural, and that is that we ought to fear death. It's supposed to explain why we avoid so many dangerous things. It explains why I'm lecturing to you through Zoom. But there's an ancient school of thought that has long questioned the rationality of the fear of death. That school of thought is Epicureanism, and it's a challenge that a lot of philosophers who have defended the fear of death have had to face for the last 2,000 years. The Epicurean challenge is quite simple. It's that there's nothing to fear about death in the same way that there's nothing to be feared about what things were like before you were born, not having existed. Because non-existence is just nothing. And death is just like that. Then there's nothing to fear about death. There may be something to fear about dying, the very transition between life and death. Those can be painful. Those can be heart-wrenching. That is to be feared. But according to the Epicureans, what happens after that, death itself, is not something to be feared. It's something that Socrates argued in the Apology. There have been a lot of philosophers throughout the ages who have tried to argue against Epicureanism. Thomas Nagel very recently argued that deprivation is what explains why a lot of things are to be feared in general, why things are bad or wrong. All kinds of deprivation. Depriving someone of their property, depriving someone of their future opportunities. These are some of the most serious wrongs we human beings think one could inflict on the other. And death itself is a deprivation. It's a deprivation of all future experience. Once you die, there are many experiences that you could have that you are now deprived of having. Now, it's true that this can explain why it's bad to give somebody a premature death. Why? Because when someone suffers a premature death, there are a lot of experiences that we expect them to have. We might even say they're entitled to have. And when death is brought about for those people, there are certain things that we've deprived of them. But that's not a general explanation of why death is bad overall. There are many people who have lived to a very old age, and we don't expect them to have many more future experiences. It's true that their death deprives them of more experiences in the future. But are they really entitled to those kinds of experiences? One of the critiques of Nagel's deprivation account says that it can't explain why all deprivation is to be feared. Some deprivations, when you deprive somebody of something to which they're not even entitled to in the first place, that's not to be feared because that's not even wrong. For example, if we're both at the supermarket and you pick up the last Ghirardelli 60% dark chocolate bar, you've deprived me of something because I wanted it too. But it's not something that you've wronged me for and it's most certainly not something that I should fear. You haven't unjustly deprived me of that bar. It just so happened that you got it. Not all deprivation is both bad and to be feared. And so an Epicurean can respond to Nagel by saying, some deaths, the deaths that are not premature or wrongfully gotten, are the kinds of deaths that shouldn't be feared. There's no general fear of death. There's also this weird argument that Scheffler takes up later in the chapter. And I'm going to mention it here just because it's philosophically clever. There's this other Epicurean line of thinking that Scheffler responds to later on in chapter 3. The view is that fear only makes sense in the context of uncertainty. So for instance, you may fear that you're going to get the coronavirus, and that only makes sense if you're not sure whether you're going to get it. However, the argument goes, if you're 100% sure that you're going to get the coronavirus, then 
it's an unreasonable attitude to fear it. You're going to get it. So stop fearing it. It's a very strange argument. And the reason why it's strange is because it doesn't take into consideration a real distinction that Scheffler is make that Scheffler is going to make, which is that there's propositional fear and the state of fear. What's propositional fear? Propositional fear is just the way we talk about fear. Propositional fear is when we say, I'm afraid that my tire is going to blow. That's why I'm filling it up with air. When we talk that way, when we fear that something will happen, we only say that when we are uncertain. We don't say it when we're absolutely sure. When we're absolutely sure, we don't say, I fear that my tire will burst. When we're sure, we say, my tire is going to burst. So we won't use the word fear. But that's just a feature of the way that we talk about it. Besides propositional fear, there's the state of fear, the emotional state of mind. The emotional state of mind is surely something you can have, even if you know for sure something's going to happen. You can be in the emotional state of mind of fear, even though you're absolutely sure that you're going to get the coronavirus or that my tire is going to explode. However, this does lead to one response to Epicureanism, which is the view that the state of fear, this emotional state of mind, is not something that's reasonable or unreasonable, whether it's something you should feel or shouldn't feel. The objection goes, fear is just one of these emotions, state of minds, that people have or don't. You can't rationalize it or make it irrational. It's not responsive to arguments like Epicureanism. It just is. That kind of objection to Epicureanism is something that Scheffler rejects. And the reason why is he doesn't think that the state of fear, being an emotional state, really is unresponsive to reasons, evidence, things like that. For some people it is. But just because that's true of some people doesn't mean it's not the kind of thing that's reasonable or unreasonable. Phobias are the kind of things that we know some people have. Phobias are a paradigmatic example of what, we, of what we might call unreasonable fear. If I present an arachnophobe with a spider that's not going to bite them, not going to do anything harmful to anybody, it's just a specimen, a biological specimen that we have, and this person is filled with so much fear they can't go near it, we might say, that's a phobia. That's an unreasonable fear. Reasonable fears are ones that track dangers and harms. Similarly, when certain prejudiced people are fearful in a state of fear, when they encounter certain other people, we say they're being unreasonable. Scheffler believes that fear of death can be just like this. Just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's not reasonable or unreasonable. He thinks it is responsive to reasons. There can be irrational fears of death and rational fears of death. And so just pointing out that it's a state of fear is not enough to respond to Epicureanism. And finally, the response to Epicureanism that Scheffler takes most seriously in the chapter is Bernard Williams, who has a view about the purpose of life, actually, that he formulates and formulates into a rejection of the Epicurean challenge. The distinction that's important to Williams is the distinction between categorical desires and what Williams calls conditional desires. Categorical desires are things that you want, but aren't subject to the condition that you're alive. Here's one way to think about it. Conditional desires, the ones that are not categorical, are the ones that you would formulate in this way. As long as I'm alive, I want dot, dot, dot. 
For example, I want to get my cavities filled. That really is formulated, as long as I'm alive, I want to get my cavities filled. Very few people, I think, will have that desire once they're dead. I think very few people will say, even once I'm dead, make sure my cavities are filled. Right? You might be a grandparent and, says, and, and, and have the desire that you grandchildren spend Thanksgiving with you. So as, as long as you're alive, you want your grandchildren to spend Thanksgiving here. But once you're dead, you don't care where they spend their Thanksgiving. These conditional desires are different from the categorical desires, which are the desires you have whether you're alive or dead. For example, you desire that climate change be reversed. You desire that wars will end. Or you might have the desire that people study philosophy. You want these things whether you're alive or dead. As long as you're alive, you want these things. But once you're dead, you still want these things. That is, you want them to be true of the world even after your death. And by the way, I think Scheffler has a really good section where he points out that these kinds of desires aren't exhaustive, that there are others. So for instance, think about the desire, I want lots of people at my funeral. That's certainly not a conditional desire. Right? You don't think, as long as I'm alive, I want lots of people at my funeral. Right? That makes no sense. Um, it's also hard to categorize that as a categorical, categorical desire. Right? It's more of like a desire of, once I'm dead, I want lots of people at my funeral. But it's not true that once I'm alive, I want a lot of people at my funeral. Anyways, Williams didn't draw out exhaustive categories, and there are these other categories that we're not going to talk too much about. Bernard Williams' view is that categorical desires propel you into the future. What does that mean? It means they're the things that motivate you through life. It's the satisfaction of categorical desires that drive you to do one thing after another. If you conceive of life as just a series of moments in time in which you're doing something, right now you're taking a philosophy course. Next semester, you might take a different kind of course. Some of you might be seniors, and you graduate, and you're going to apply for jobs. You might go out with friends looking for somebody to date. All of these kinds of things that you do that propel you into the future are based on things that you want. Some of them are things that you want on the condition that you're alive, but many of them are projects that you undertake hoping that the world will be a certain way, even when you're not alive. And the thing that's interesting about categorical desires, on Williams' view, is that they definitely do propel you into the future. It makes you have desires about the future, desires about your place in it, and also desire to accomplish one thing after another. But it doesn't propel you indefinitely into the future. That is, Williams points out that if you live long enough, you will become hopelessly bored. Categorical desires have this feature that whether they're satisfied or not, being the kind of thing that propels you into the future makes you care less and less about them. The Alina Makropoulos case is a piece of fiction that was in drama. Right? And the idea behind this piece of fiction was that there was a woman who had decided that she was going to stay 42 for a long, long time. Let's not say forever. Forever is very long. But by the age of 342, she had become so hopelessly bored in life that she wanted to end it. Why would you want to end it? Why couldn't it be that you just have all of these categorical desires, like reversing climate change, or curing cancer, or something to that effect? Why can't that propel you deep into the distant future, maybe even forever? I think there are a couple of reasons why you might think this. 
One view might be that for any human life that's long enough, there are only so many categorical desires that a human being can have before they stop having them altogether. There are only so many things that a human being wants to accomplish before they stop wanting new things to accomplish. That might be one idea. Another idea might be that the set of categorical desires that are distinctively human, you might accomplish many of them, and some of them might be frustrated. But the mere cycle of having accomplishments and frustrations starts becoming uninteresting after a long enough time. I'm talking to you and you're very young, so you probably haven't had too many of your categorical desires satisfied, and, and hopefully you will. So the best analogy I can think of is if you were in the presence of only a few types of video games and you've beaten them over and over and over again, and those are all the video games there are. Maybe there are some video games that you just can't ever beat. You just keep getting frustrated by them. But if you stretched out your life long enough, either you're never going to beat that video game or you're going to beat it 500,000 times. Either way, the very act of playing those games, if those were all the games there were, will lose its interest after a long enough time. How long might that be? I don't know. But if you think about immortality, that's longer than five trillion years, six trillion years. Any finite number you can think of is the smallest of numbers compared to infinity. The idea behind the Alina Macropolis case might just very well be that categorical desires, as long as they're a limited range or there's only so much that human beings can have, will get intolerably boring if you keep satisfying the same ones over and over. Or if you're frustrated, you're tired of the fact that you've experienced the frustration over and over again. Either way, boredom is inevitable. We're going to take a break here now and come back for the second part of this lecture. The other point that Williams wants to make with the Alina Macropolos case is that any way of trying to solve the problem of boredom will turn into a life that is not recognizably human. Another way of putting it is it will turn into a life that's not recognizably a life in which a single person persists. What do I mean by that? Think about somebody who says, look, I can easily imagine a life in which I won't get bored. After 120 years, I'll have my memories wiped, and then everything will seem afresh and new to me. And if that happens, then I can live on indefinitely. I'll just cycle back every 120 years. That's possible, but it's not true that that's a recognizably human life. And it's not true that that's recognizably a life in which the same person gets to persist forever. We just did a unit on personal identity. Whatever you thought about the psychological continuity view, it's still true that if your memories were wiped every 120 years and you start living anew, it's arguable that that's not a very human-looking life. And it's even more arguable that it's not you, a new person, gets to come into being every 120 years. Scheffler, when he examines Williams's thought experiment here, draws a very distinctive lesson. It's a wide-ranging lesson. And the lesson is that the very idea of value in a human life depends on that life having stages. And having stages to a life is shaped by mortality. Having stages in life only makes sense if there was an end. For instance, feeling accomplished or having satisfaction requires there to be an end to something, maybe not to life, but to a project. Getting a diploma, a first job, 
having a first child, a first grandchild, being motivated to stay healthy, being motivated to seek out safety, security, and benefits, all take place under the background that human beings are vulnerable, vulnerable to death, vulnerable to sickness, and that the only, there's only a certain amount of time left to do something. All of this, of course, assumes that we're these embodied beings. That is, we have bodies with the vulnerability of bodies, the aging of it, and so forth. Of course, if we get rid of that assumption, maybe life wouldn't necessarily need to have stages. But if that's true, once again, it seems like we're not talking about a distinctively human life. We're talking about godlike lives. And when we're conceptualizing non-human beings, we're talking about beings that are different enough from us that we're no longer talking about the value of a human life. We're talking about the value of a godlike life. And how does the value of a godlike life tell us about the value of a human life? There's an analogy that Scheffler makes to justice. John Rawls, the political philosopher, one of the greatest ones of the 20th century, made this observation. The observation is that the circumstances of justice depend on material scarcity. That is, in order for there to be justice and injustice, there has to be a short supply of stuff. Money, housing, land, food. All of the goods that human beings need in order to lead a good life. If there was no such scarcity, there's no question of justice or injustice. Right now, there are all kinds of discussions about whether it's fair for one group of people to have all of these resources while another group of people starve or have no opportunities to life. If there was no scarcity of those resources, if there was just an endless supply of material goods, then there wouldn't be a question of injustice or justice. People could just acquire whatever it is that they wanted or needed. The lesson from Williams' thought experiment for Scheffler is that human beings, human values, the kind of values that human beings have for their own lives, depends on temporal scarcity. It depends on time being a scarce resource. The value of our health, the value of getting a Vassar degree or going to medical school, the value of writing a book and being an artist, trying to finish a triathlon, or the value of knowledge. These are values that depend on the fact that our lives will end eventually. According to Scheffler, values only make sense in the context of limited choices and vulnerability to loss. If there was no limits, there would be no value. Very concretely, what would be the value of getting a degree at Vassar, getting into medical school, if time was limitless? You might think, actually, there is a value. There's some experiences that I could have during this time, and those are valuable experiences. But another way to think about it is, well, you don't have to do it now. You can do it sometime in the next 5,000 years and you would still have greater than five trillion years left in your life. There's no reason either way for you to do things now or later. Once time is limitless, there's no reason to do any particular thing at any particular moment. Similarly, health would not be a value if time weren't scarce and your life would be eternal. Scheffler thinks that everything we work for and towards, everything we celebrate and feel sad about, depend on the idea that human lives run out. So human values depend on mortality. Human beings require their own deaths to lead a distinctively valuable life. And so the question that we began the lecture with is Epicureanism. Is the fear of death irrational? Scheffler doesn't think so. 
It might be rational after all, but he doesn't give a good argument against Epicureanism. What he does think is that if you put this chapter together with the other two, you get the conclusion that humans require their own deaths to live a distinctively valuable life. And humans require that other human beings live on after them in order to lead a distinctively valuable life. So it follows that it's definitely irrational to fear your own death more than fearing the death of the collective afterlife of human beings. So while he doesn't make clear whether he thinks fear of your own death is irrational, you should definitely be more fearful that other people are not going to live in the future than it is that you're going to die. Let's end this lecture with some discussion questions. If you took a catalog of your strongest and most motivating desires today, how much do you think they are shaped by or depend on the fact that you're mortal and that you'll eventually age and die? This is a question that is really asking you to assess how true Scheffler's observations are. Secondly, is there really no inconceivable life that is both human, immortal, and preserves your identity, but also doesn't lead to eventual boredom? We only looked at a couple of examples, becoming 42 and then living a long time after that, or becoming an ageless, non-human body type person. Is it even possible for a human being who can barely think of what a trillion is to think of an infinite life? That question really is coming from the fact that when you talk to people about how much money is out there and you say six trillion or three trillion, most people can't even fathom that. But when you're talking about immortality, living forever, three trillion is a tiny number compared to forever. Can human beings even conceive of living that long? Anyways, answer just one of these for 10 or 15 minutes, bring it to class, and we'll have a discussion.